This is Duke University. On today's Left of Black, we're joined by journalist and activist Kevin Alexander Gray and Color Lines managing editor Akiba Solomon as we talk about stop and frisk, challenges to the Voting Rights Act, and a culture of rape. I'm Mark Anthony Neal, and this is Left of Black. Yeah. Eric, you're a real life chief for this one. <laughs> yeah. Good afternoon and welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and we are joined this afternoon by Akiba Solomon, writer and managing editor, the editor of Colorlines.com, co-editor with Ayanna Bird of Naked. Black women bear all their skin, hair, hips, and <laughs> lips, and other parts, which was published in 2005. It's <laughs> We're also joined by longtime organizer and journalist Kevin Alexander Gray, author of Waiting for Lightning to Strike, The Fundamentals of Black Politics. How are you both doing this afternoon? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. <laughs> Yourself, Kevin? I'm good. I'm good. Kevin, uh, a few weeks ago, you published a piece called The Legal Fight to Protect White Power, uh, looking at some of the conversation that's coming out of the Supreme Court around the renewal of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, talk a little bit about your inspiration for that piece, and particularly this title, this idea that you know, this kind of uh, assault, if you will, in the Voting Rights Act is really connected to the maintenance of white power. Well, you know, I actually wrote it so that there would be a primer for people to make the arguments in defense of the Voting Rights Act so they would understand it. You hear people talk about Section 3, you hear them talk about Section 5 and preclearance. But I wrote that for a younger generation primarily to understand why the Voting Rights Act was important, why it was important to defend it, what kinds of things did it protect in addition to uh, being the, the main tool against this fight for voter ID and all this enhanced kinds of uh, uh, documentation that you need to vote. And you know, when I came up, your word was your bond. And, you know, I have been to polling places in the past where people wrote an X, and that was good enough yeah. for the polling person. So, you know, I really wanted this, the, the generation, my kids, my grandkids, to really understand the importance of the Voting Rights Act, how it really did prevent uh, racist uh, Southern uh, politicians and whatnot to, to run roughshod over our voting rights, to, to take away the power to vote. And, um, and then, of course, I want to also talk about it being a double-edged sword in that we use the Voting Rights Act down here to increase the number of black elected officials that we have across the country, primarily in the South. But in all these state legislatures where blacks have been negotiating with Republicans for the last 10 or 20 years because of the Voting Rights Act, we have a lot more blacks in, in these southern state legislatures. We have less white Democrats, and we have less power. One of the things I want to kind of uh, draw into this conversation, Akiba, um, and of course Color Alliance has covered all this conversation also, and, and, and it's a point that Kevin really just made about the fact that part of the reason why he wrote the piece was to, to be able to connect with younger folks who don't necessarily have a grounding in the kind of historical moment that created the need for the Voting Rights Act. What do you say to young folks who are like, well, you know, why should I be concerned about that? We're in a nation where we have a black president now. Um, clearly there aren't any impediments for us to be able to vote the way we want to vote, you know, if we were able to elect a black president. So, so why should this be an issue of, of critical importance for folks? Well, I mean, I think, I think Kevin really brought up a valuable point in terms of providing a primer, because I think one of the obstacles in general is just a lack of historical knowledge that mm. if, if there's a culture of a historicism in this country. And I think that it's getting worse um, because there's so much information available that people can actually believe that they are steeped in a particular history um, because they can go on Wikipedia, they can right. go on, you know, whatever.com and get bits and pieces and not quite get the context. So it's really, really important at this point for people to not only present that history, but to put it in a context that isn't you know, 365 McDonald's, oh, you know, we, we award the people who did the sit-in and yay, and okay, now we have a black president. Like, obviously, so there were some intervening things. So, you know, I mean, I, I can't actually give the two-second answer about 
why the Voting Rights Act is important. It's not a two-second answer type of thing. Yeah. But what I can do is say that we really have to have reliable sources that provide the important context and the important racial and systemic context for people to actually share and use and read and that it be clear and cohesive. But what do we then do with Justice Scalia, who in a kind of flip logic you know, argues that the Voting Rights Act is a form of racial entitlement, um, that it's a form of black privilege, you know, in that kind of context. I mean, what do we do with that kind of nonsense in this context? I, I mean, sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Well, you know, listen, it, it's clear that we always attack racism and racist statements, even at the highest level. And our movement is about attacking white supremacy. The idea of the Voting Rights Act was about the erosion of white supremacy. Yeah. It was about the erosion of white entitlement. And when you look at who's making the changes to the voting districts, who's making the changes to the voting laws, it's primarily white men who feel like they have to protect their sense of entitlement, their ability to run things. But just as um, uh, uh, John Britton at Howard said, it's a procedural tactic. It's making people jump through hoops. Young people understand jumping through hoops. Before people can just change things, there ought to be a hoop that they need to jump through to prove that what they're doing is not discriminatory. Well, I also think, I also think though, that there's a culture right now that speaks to the idea that you shouldn't have to jump through hoops. And um, I think that sometimes that can be misleading to not only young people, but just people in general who become much more involved in a civic, who have become involved in what they consider to be civic discussions based on, you know, the, the election of Barack Obama. And so, you know, I, I, I read a lot of stuff online. I read a lot of tweets. I read a lot of posts. And there's this idea that, like, you know, I shouldn't actually have to justify that to you. And I think that that spirit is a really important spirit. I just think it's a matter of, again, going back to history and letting people know that no, you actually do have to, on a really incremental level, not prove it because um, it's untrue, but prove it because this is a legal proceeding and because a Supreme Court Justice of the United States decided all of a sudden that a constitutional right was an entitlement. Yeah. And that is actually just some of the best dog whistle coded language I've ever you know read about. So, you know, for that person to be using uh, dog whistles during an actual, you know, during a, a Supreme Court hearing around the Voting Rights Act really speaks to, like, the, the very pervasive white supremacy that's in place. And we just have to let people know. You're watching Left of Black. We're joined this afternoon by Color Lines Managing Editor Akiva Solomon. We're also joined by Kevin Alexander Gray, longtime organizer and journalist, author of Waiting for Lightning to Strike, The Fundamentals of Black Politics. Uh, we're in a conversation now, you know, in the aftermath of the school shootings in December, where there's a lot of focus on, on gun violence. And in some ways, it's taking the attention off of uh, questions of, of stop and frisk policies like in New York City, that was until, you know, a little more than two weeks ago, and we had the shooting death uh, by the NYPD of Kamani Gray. And, you know, the thing that struck me about this story, and, and I'm in the car with my 14-year-old daughter, and, and we have these moments, you know, our NPR moments every morning for about 15 minutes, and, and occasionally we'll hear a story that I'll need to rant on, you know, for however long. And, and because she's never had the kind of New York experience that I grew up with, you know, trying to talk to her about the landscape is, is often a little difficult for her to understand. But here you have a 16-year-old boy, um, you know, who carries because, you know, he's under prey like so many young folks are in urban settings. And you have two plain cold clothes police officers, you know, coming after you. How are you supposed to know that they're police officers? You know, so it's almost perfectly logical that, you know, a 16 year old might pull a gun because he thinks he's about to be in a situation. And, and of course, he gets shot by the NYPD. And, and we understand it now that it's a direct product of stop and frisk policies in New York City, you know, uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg. And, and so what do we say to this larger narrative where we're hearing the NRA talking about arming Americans and protecting themselves against, you know, potential crime and violence. And we have young black kids who essentially do this, right, to protect themselves from gangs and other kind of forces in, in cities. And, and yet, you know, they're not getting the same kind of narrative protection, if you will, 
you know, from the NRA and some of these more conservative forces? I mean, I, you know, I, I think that it's very clear that the NRA is not talking to Kamani, the Kamani Grays of the world. Yeah. And so, you know, I've seen a couple of sort of half-hearted attempts, I would say, from um, black conservatives to, to try to make this issue be one of bearing arms. But again, I mean, this is all just um, deploying certain talking heads to continue an agenda that, in my opinion, is a white supremacist agenda. I think that that's the case. And so what I think ends up happening is that you end up in a sort of rhetorical, you know, back and forth. And really, the nature of dog whistles is such that everybody knows what the message is saying, right? So then the question becomes, whose job is it to parse the message? And how do you get the message out? People know Kamani Gray and his folks knew that the NRA were not talking to him. The NYPD yeah. knows that the NRA is not talking to Kamani Gray. Everybody knows that the NRA is not talking to them. So that's how you end up with that. It's just another rhetorical game. And, you know, they're very good at playing that game. Kevin, you're in a state where I'm, they... where I'm they a be- radical on the gun thing. I, 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 well, Kevin, you're in a state where they believe in packing. <laughs> you know, so, so what does that conversation look like, you know, in a Columbia, South Carolina, you know, versus what that conversation looks like in Brooklyn or Chicago. Well, now, you know, I was on the ACLU National Board for a number of years, and um, the state president here, I've been a lot of NRA dinners as a president of ACLU <laughs> and the only black person except the people serving in the room. And uh, there, are, there, are more, there are more groups than the NRA out there. There's Gun Owners of America. There are the people for concealed carry permits that are, that are out there. And so to just look at, you know, there are 350 million guns in the country. Um, everybody that has a gun aren't members of the NRA. Right. Having a gun isn't just about hunting and fishing. It's, a lot of people believe that the Second Amendment is the Revolution Amendment. No one wants to have that conversation out in the main. No right. question the NRA's constituency group isn't Kamani Gray or black folk, uh, their, their reaction to the Black Panthers in the 60s packing shows their response to black folk having right. guns. And, 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 the, and the reality is that the majority of those 350 million guns are owned by whites. So, you know, you know for, for politicians to say the Second Amendment's about hunting and fishing, I defy them to go back and look at any historical document and see where the founding party <laughs> found was arguing <laughs> the Second Amendment. That being said, since the slave codes and the black codes, they've been profiling young black men. Young black men are always going to be viewed upon as the most dangerous creature in this country because they, white folk feel like they're the most likely to rebel because they have the most economic pressures put on them. If you look in the city of New York, what you got, 50% unemployment among black males nice. in the city of New York. And so, of course, black folk are chattel. Most of the time they're using these stop and frisk arrest. They might make a marijuana bus, so then they got them going through that system, such as the war on drugs. Right now the war on drugs is the latest tool that people use to, to uh, profile young black folk. But, but black males, from the time that they had the word wilding, Mm. And they eroded those young brothers in Central Park. Black males are uh, profiled. We've got some folks talking about passing ordinances so that we can find them for wearing baggy pants. It, any reason to stop black males. If you live in public housing and you're a black male, more than likely your parents surrendered your Fourth Amendment rights. That came out of the Clinton administration of one strike and you're out of public housing. So a part of this is a fixture of the war on drugs. But a part of it is the basic racial profiling that's been going on since they profiled black folk on the northern coast of Africa and took them back to Portugal. We've been talking about Kevin Alexander Gray, longtime organizer and journalist, also Akiva Solomon, who's a writer and managing editor for ColorLines.com. She's a co-editor with Iona Bird of Naked. Black women bear all about their skin, hair, hips, and lips, and other parts. Um, I, I want to segue a little bit because uh, our colleague Zelina Maxwell uh, was on Fox the other day. Um, and, you know, the folks on Fox were very much proponents of, of women packing, 
you know, as a rationale for having guns to prepare, you know, to uh, protect themselves from potential rapists. Um, and Zerlina's response was, no, the best way to do that is for us just to teach men not to rape. Uh, and of course, besides the fact that she was, wasn't able to get that out in the conversation on Fox News that day, um, of course, she had this whole kind of moment of, of all of this kind of hate mail and, and death threats and all these things directed to her. And, you know, as, as some folks have called what has been this March, you know, March Madness, given the kind of response to Zelina's comments, uh, given the, stu the coverage of the Steubenville rape case, in which so many of the corporate media companies seem to, to be more concerned about the fate of these two young men um, who are no longer accused rapists, but convicted rapists, um, you know, as, a vo as opposed to the victim. And, and then our good friend, uh, Rosé, uh, you know, down in South Beach, who, who just recorded a new song uh, with some other dude uh, that nobody knows who he is, um, you know, where he basically details and celebrates a, a date rape. Um, what do we do about this culture of rape um, that, you know, is, is so explicit and there's almost no way to kind of challenge it on a systematic basis at this point. Well, I mean, I think this, that's a really complicated question. I think the first thing to do is to really identify what rape is. I mean, I, I literally think, and, and this just comes from conversations that I've had with men in my life, that there are certain practices that men, and by extension, young girls and women, don't call rape. They don't call running yeah. a train rape. Yeah. They call yeah. it a train. Part of the reason why they do that is because there is some area where people, particularly men and boys, believe that some of that behavior is consensual. And that behavior can be consensual in a moment, and then it can become not consensual. And so it's a very right. gray area. Yeah. Yeah. The question becomes, number one, how do you actively explain to men and boys and women and girls and everything in between that they need to have explicit consent. Right, which was Zerlina's point, right? That's Zerlina's point. That's also Salamisha Tillett's point with the long walk home. That's also the point of many other, many of the other, you know, anti-rape activists who, who really do occupy this online space and in general. But the problem is in practice, you know, there is not, I don't think, a, sexu a healthy sexuality, mm -hmm. the idea mm -hmm. that young men and boys need to have a healthy sense of their own sexuality, and that sex is not something that is there for not only domination, but also for you to profit off of it by talking about how you slip a molly in a girl's drink and then you have fun with that. And also, I just want to say one more thing about Rick Ross while we're talking about it. Rick Ross was a corrections officer, okay? He was a corrections officer, and he's like 40-something years old. old. Yeah. And so the idea that, you know, um, for the convenience or for the relevance or whatever this is, that you're going to slip something like that in there, that makes it even more problematic. And the idea what, that that gets embedded into a discussion about hip-hop or culture or whatever, that is so foreign and just out of control for that grown, beyond grown man to say that. And it goes back to even the Too Short incident, where you have a Too Short explaining, basically, on video through XXL's website, how you um, court a girl. And part of that courting is pushing her up against the wall and inserting fingers into her vagina. Once again, we have a man who is beyond grown hmm. perpetuating these ideas. And so that speaks to, number one, the a prevalence of rape culture, but also it speaks to a, a real breakdown in people understanding that certain behaviors, I'm not saying that they're all rape. I'm not saying that they're all, you know, not consensual. What I am saying is that when you package that and then you commercialize it and then you spread it around, it creates this whole idea that this behavior is always consensual and that it's always okay. Kevin, uh, to kind of jump into that, because one of the things that we're, we're probably almost clear about with those two boys in Steubenville is that no one had ever had a conversation with them about consent, that they had no clue what that was, you know, which is why they could flow so freely the way that they did. How do we begin to have these conversations, um, in this instance, particularly with young boys, about what consent is? Well, you know what, first, Akiva, as they say, 
day at church, hey, amen, go right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's not all, you know, that was beautiful. <laughs> and, and some of the way that you explained, the, even the idea of running a train. Now, you know what? A lot of people, we understand that. And, and um, I have a son, I have a daughter, I have granddaughters, I have grandsons. So we have to have this conversation. Mm-hmm. And no, you know, with us, it's no means no, and the person has to have the capacity to say no. So that's important. Yeah, right, right. And, right. But the, the other part of it is for everybody involved, because no question national media seem to give the, the perpetrators of the crime more compassion than the victim of the crime. But when you think about it as an adult, everybody is a victim. And, and we have to accept that. Um, there are a lot of feminists who don't see those two men who have been young men who have been brought up in a rape culture. Because right. we, you know, we right. did, we did take over, uh, somebody took over this country by rape, murder, and genocide. I mean, that's all part of it. We're looking at the results of a war in Iraq, 10 years after Iraq, where people have come back broken because of what they did in war. And, you know, we, our culture is about competition, about being the biggest, the baddest, being the brute. We're talking about black males, all those stereotypes based on brutish behavior. We're talking about rap music, and we all know the misogyny that's in, in, in rap music. We all know about the homophobia in our community. We know all of these things, the machismo. And so, you know, the idea, we do have to have a discussion, but we do also have to talk about how do we end the circle of brutality or the the cycle of violence. We've got to talk about whether or not we're a culture of redemption and rehabilitation and forgiveness as opposed to revenge. We know... Can I just say, I'm sorry, just one, just one thing that I have to jump in and say, though, is that I do think that there is a hierarchy of victimhood. Yeah. I think uh-huh. that once, you know, we, we I, I'm having a little bit of trouble equating the victimhood of the boys and also the bystanders who didn't, who were not prosecuted. Right. And the people right. who spread it and the girls who were actually charged with threatening the victim of this assault. Um, I but well, go ahead. I just wanted to jump in. That every, okay. Everybody that's down in the ditch gets dirty, and 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 that's that's my point. I, I'm not saying a crime wasn't committed and something terrible wasn't committed. The the point with me is, how do you heal people? How do you heal those kids? How do you heal the kids that are coming up in this culture of violence that we live in, where we have a president with a kill list? where we're talking about a war in which millions of people died and, and are based on a lie, where we have a, uh, an economy that's based on competition. Everything is based on being bigger and badder and conquest. So actually, you- actually, everything isn't based on that. Everything is based on that for men. What is based <laughs> on, everything is based on that for men. Women are not encouraged to be bigger or badder or more militaristic or any of those things. And so I think within this conversation, we really have to be clear that, number one, the victim is in the forefront. Number two, that the perpetrators or the boys or whatever you want to call them did something very violent. And then number three, to me, talk about how you respond to that violence. But I'm pushing this whole idea of the hierarchy of victimhood because if we look at this through the lens of a, it's a cultural lens, but then we look at it through the lens of patriarchy, which is essentially right. what we're looking at it through, we're going to miss an important element of right. how to even deal with this idea. I, it, it mean, I mean, part of what Akiva is saying, and, and, and I hear what both of you are saying in this regard, but you know, the, the reality of male privilege means that you know, male victimhood gets pushed to the front in ways that, that female victimhood doesn't within this context. Uh, the, the irony of this, and, and, and sadly, is that if there had not been this social media context for this to go down, you know, most folks would have never heard of this case. You know, this case would have been just another, you know, example of the kind of date rape that occurs, you know, in teenage culture and college culture and mainstream American culture, um, you know, on an everyday basis. Um, it's, it's been a great conversation. Uh, Kevin, Alexand- Kevin Gray Alexander, who joins us from South Carolina, Uh, author of the book, Waiting for Lightning to Strike, The Fundamentals of Black Politics. And we've also been joined by Akiva Solomon, 
uh, who is the managing editor of ColorLines.com, co-editor with Iona Bird of Naked. Black women bear all about their skin, hair, hips, lips, and other parts. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. Eric, you're a real life Eric. G for this one. <laughs> yeah. All black everything. All black, you know. All black in the name of all my black heroes. All black everything. All black polos. All black medallions, yeah. All black, you know, say. All black everything. All black, you know. All black in the name of all my black heroes.